Now hopefully this allows you to see a little bit about where I am. I'm beneath the city of Rome in, believe it or not, the sewer system. And it's a good thing you can see and not smell where I am because it doesn't smell all that great. This is kind of the ugly bottom of the city of Rome that all Rome, all cities across the world have. It's a functioning water and sewage system. But the Romans really perfected this and allowed their civilization and primarily the city of Rome to really expand because think about it. In order to have all these citizens live in one place, you need fresh water. And the Romans developed a way to bring water from the closest water systems and streams and mountains and lakes all the way to the heart of Rome, which allowed them to not only drink clean water, cleanse themselves, but to do some fascinating things that we're gonna to learn today. The Romans take water and turn it into this magical experience beyond just fountains and pools, but in ways that we are going to study and look at and really ask ourselves, how did they make that happen? So, I'm gonna get out of here and go back up and in doing so, show you some of the things that the Romans developed over the course of their empire. All right, let's go. Whew. Glad to be up from down there. So, here I am on a typical Roman road. A couple episodes ago we talked about Roman roads, but what we didn't talk about was how waters ran through these roads. As you see behind me, there are a couple of these footsteps, three stones if you will, kind of like a crosswalk that allows you to get from one side of the street sidewalk to the other side. And they're quite tall because they allow you to walk over and not get your feet or your toe go wet in what would be uh, during a rainstorm, this current of water, but also because there was a lot of garbage and soot and sometimes sewage in the streets of Rome, they would be flushed out and this current of water with all this stuff would be pushed out and go down back into the sewer where I just came. Obviously street water isn't to drink, it runs off and goes back down into the sewers. The more important thing is where do you get the fresh water from? And so let's go take a look at what that would have looked like. Now the Romans created a system that we refer to as an aqueduct system. And here's just one segment of an aqueduct. And you can see how important arches play a role in building this kind of thing. There are large arches in the below, uh, followed by smaller arches on top. And of course, because this is negative space, the space where there is no material, stone or concrete, it means less time and energy and resources to build what inevitably is going to be this long aqueduct wall. <clears throat> That's going to take us from these reservoir systems that exist high up in the mountain, go through hills and mountains and begin to then gently curve as the water pools goes down through these aqueducts and slowly but surely slants and diminishes in a very systematic way so that over the course of miles and miles as it gets closer to the city the slope allows the water to gently flow down and as it gets to the city and these aqueduct walls are built through the city there's enough height so that the water can then slope down into and rush through the pipes into people's homes and all the various baths and fountains of cross Rome. Of course, a time when there is no pumps or electricity, this is important. You need gravity to move water. Now, where does the water move in an aqueduct system? Well, there's a small channel above the wall. This is what the whole wall is doing. It's creating this this, this uh, tunnel, if you will, where the water rushes from the rush of reservoir, flows down, sloping down, and eventually comes right out into the city. Now, there are many gardens and fountains across the city, and of course, you need water for this. So, if you were somebody who had lived in another non-Roman city, and you were used to the filth and dirt <clears throat> and having to bring your water in from the nearest rivers, you would be in awe of this city to have water, the resource of water, essentially flowing about everywhere you look. 
Now, one of the water systems the Romans did not perfect was water to extinguish a fire. And in July of 64 AD, there was a historic fire that ravaged a good portion of Rome under the Emperor Nero. Now, after several days, the Romans managed to put the fire out and any other normal emperor would have reconstructed those houses and homes, lost to the Roman citizens and built goodwill. But Nero wasn't that type of emperor. He decided to build his own private estate, so big and so grand that it took the heart of the city just to fit most of the home in there. And we're not just talking about one home, we're talking about lakes, vineyards, places for his horses and animals to roam, and of course, many, many lavish rooms for all his guests and family. Now imagine the size of something like Golden Gate Park in San Francisco or Central Park in New York, uh, something that takes a big chunk of the city, but rather than being a public park, it's actually somebody's private estate. And this is what Nero's villa, it was his summer home, but within the city limits. You can imagine people were angry at this structure having lost their homes and then seeing somebody's private home being built would have drove most people, most Romans, mad. But the important part of this building is we refer to it as the Golden House. And it's the first time where we see a hemispherical dome with oculus being attempted by Roman architects and engineers. Now this is an important step because in the evolution of the dome, and in next week we're gonna see how this progresses to one of the most important buildings the Romans do. The villa is ornate inside. It's covered with gems, jewels on the wall, painted ornately, and he would have these lavish parties and so forth and so on. People loved being around him for his wealth and power, but personally, he wasn't all that nice. Matter of fact, he ends up killing his mother, who he thinks is going to attempt to take power from him. So, obviously, a ruling party whose family has some disturbing attributes. Nero has made a large golden sculpture of himself on the estate, and he has a large man-made lake where he could go about on his private boat and have these lavish parties. Now, when Nero dies, something new is built, and it's the Colosseum. They destroy his golden house and his estate, and the Colosseum is built, and symbolically, it's a public house a public place of entertainment that is taking the place of somebody's private home. So symbolically, this is very important for the Romans and the new emperor, uh, Vespasian. Now, the Colosseum is essentially a series of arches that are ideal for creating something this size, but it also allows for all the 60,000 plus fans who will be coming in and out of the building. But what? how did they create such a... Uh, concept for an arena. Well, they go back to the Greeks. And if you remember the Greek theater, which was built on the side of a hill, it's the semi-circle uh, configuration where people gathered to listen to dramas and Greek tragedies. Well, what the Romans did is they amplified that theater. And so what we really call the Colosseum, its actual name is an amphitheater. It's a theater that's been amplified. So, the reason we give it the name of an arena is because the floor was covered with sand, which in Latin is called uh, arena. Um, and so this is where we get the generic name arena. Now, why sand? Well, much like cat litter, it's a good way to soak up the blood and gore of the um, fights between animals and um, gladiators who fight to the death. Now, imagine yourself here as one of the many spectators watching this um, series of events that would happen daily um, from morning all the way into the night. And you would be watching the gladiators. Now, gladiators weren't just chosen from the streets. They were actually trained. And there was a gladiator school right next to the Colosseum where gladiators, mostly slaves who were forced to battle, would live, work, and train in these smaller arenas. And they were all being prepared, like professional athletes, to be these the center of this entertainment, this 
spectacle of the arena. They would be brought through tunnels, through the bottom of the Coliseum, and then brought out to the cheering crowd that would make up um, the Coliseum. Now, it is the biggest amphitheater arena in all of Rome. There were several that were along throughout the Roman Empire, but this was the biggest one. And of course, there was the emperor's seat. And during a battle, the emperor who would be sitting in his special uh, courtside seat would be determined the uh, if a gladiator lived or died. Now, spectators didn't come to the bottom floor like the um, gladiators did. They purchased a ticket, which was made with probably with terracotta, with clay, baked, had a Roman numeral on it. So you knew what section, which gate to walk through. And before walking through, just like a baseball game now, if you've ever been to, you can hear the crowd as you approach the your seat. Now, of course, who wants to sit under the hot Italian sun while you watch these gladiators beat themselves to death? So, Roman engineers and with what we think were off-duty sailors and boat builders devised a system of canopies and pulleys that allowed for a large dome-like tent to hang over the Colosseum from these large wooden posts so that over the course of the day, as the light shifted across the benches surrounding this arena, the sun would lightly only hit part of the crowd, and, and those parts were the cheap tickets. Now, you remember how the Colosseum was built on Nero's man-made lake that was part of his large summer home in the middle of the city? Well, this is where it gets really interesting. That same water system, the water system that supplied the water to his man-made lake, the aqueduct system that was supposed to bring fresh water for bathing and fountains and pools and whatnot, well, well, they used that system to convert the Colosseum into, get this, a huge pool. Now, this wasn't your splish and splash type of pool to take the kids and have a little bit of summer fun. This is where gladiators performed to the death, not on sand floors, but on boats. And it was said that during the day, there could be arena battles on sand, and at night, battle boats off floating on water. Now, just imagine if you're somebody who's new to the city from a small town. Again, there's no entertainment in most parts of the world right now of this size. Entering into this large building and then seeing floating boats battle right before your eyes. It would have been like modern day 3D movie. Now, somewhere where you could take the kids and the family were the Roman baths. Now, there were Roman baths in most Roman cities. But because we're in Rome, and Rome being the center of the Roman Empire, things have to be a little bit bigger. And the one that rivals all of them is the Baths of Catacalla. Now, emperors had this thing. They wanted to keep the population and the Roman citizens happy. You didn't want to revolt on your hands. And building a bath for the citizens was a perfect way to appease them. Now, this one is huge. You have to imagine it's like a modern-day mall. It has various places to gather, a place to work out, to read. There were libraries, cafes, gardens. So you could spend a whole day losing yourself. And if you're on the average or below average economic strata of the Roman Empire, you didn't have running water and a bath in your home. So being able to go to these and cleanse yourself and mingle with people of different economic and backgrounds, it was a real melting pot. Literally, some of the pools were hot like a melting pot. We had in one pool the frigidarium, frigid, cold water, and then you might make your way to the tepidarium, which would be a lukewarm pool, and then as you got accustomed to this water, you can make your way into the calderium, which is where the water was hot. Now, how do you make water hot on such a massive scale? Well, you use slaves, which the Romans were quite good at. So they had these basements and the 
slaves would essentially feed the fire and the feed the ovens that would create this warm air that would crawl through the bottom of the baths and heat up the walls and floor so much so that the water would get hot. In some cases, there were like steam rooms, right? The walls would be warm. So pure comfort um, at any time of year was to be found here in the Baths of Caracalla. Now, if you visit Rome, you can actually visit the ruins of the Baths of Caracalla. But with a little bit of imagination, you can see the mosaic floors, the marbled walls, and almost hear the echoes of all the bathers and swimmers and Roman citizens who used to be here on a daily basis hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Now, the Baths of Caracalla use about every Roman architectural trick. There's, of course, the arch, there's some barrel vaults, but one of the things that dominates this structure is the fenestrated sequence of groin vaults. It's done on a large scale, which allows all that natural light to filter in on the bathers on any given day. The other one, of course, is the hemispherical dome with oculus. And you can see how grand it is. Imagine swimming under this dome and having just a grand old time with your friends. Both the Colosseum and the Bass of Caracalla and at the center, the aqueduct system, are examples of why the Romans are considered the great builders of Western art.